Part One of the Lost Island of Atlantis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Lost Island of Atlantis by E. T. Fletcher. Part One. The Latin historian Lucius Aeneas Florus, in describing the progress of the Roman arms in Spain speaks of the awe with which Decimus Brutus beheld, for the first time, the sun descend into the broad Atlantic, and its fires become quenched in the illimitable western ocean. The Roman leader would perhaps have been still more impressed with the solemnity of the scene, had he thought it possible that beneath those waves there lay a buried world, that a great island with all its tenants had sunk ages ago in its depths, and that a civilization older than the lore of Egypt or the wisdom of Etruria had found amid these waters a cradle and a grave. He might have philosophized mournfully on the uncertain tenure of all human greatness, on the evanescence of a national splendor whose very sepulchres had perished and on the special destiny of a commonwealth so utterly destroyed as to leave to after ages its very existence a matter of a debatable inquiry. From all time the finger of tradition has pointed to the West as the peculiar abode of a happier and more favoured race. The gardens of the Hesperides, the islands of the blessed, the born of the Atlantids, the Western Ethiopians, the Atlantis of Plato, these are legends familiar to all. Not only has Euripides, in one of the choral songs of his Hippolytus, celebrated the happy isles where the winds blow ever softly, and the ambrosial streams flow fast by the palaces of Jove, but Pindar himself, whose birth precedes that of Herodotus by nearly a century, speaks in his second Olympiac of the island of the blessed, for with him there is but one island, fanned by ocean breezes and adorned by every blessing of fruit and flower. Thus also a modern poet Tennyson, in those fine lines of the Mort d'Arthur, suggested possibly by a well-known passage in the Fourth Odyssey, sings of, quote, The island valley of Avilion, where falls not hail or rain or any snow, nor ever wind blows loudly, but it lies deep meadowed, happy, fair with orchard lawns and bowery hollows crowned with summer sea. End quote. Even beyond the limits of classic story, everywhere and always has this oldest of legends held an abiding place in the hearts and memories of all men. Still do the inhabitants of the Aran Isles on the edge of the great western main believe that from time to time they see the shores of a happy island rise above the waves. Still in the time of Marco Polo a similar tradition prevailed among the Singalese. The sagas of the north yet speak of the island of Atle, and even the Japanese Ainos of the furthest east retain the memory of a time when there was no land but islands, and when the first of the race, after drifting long on the ocean, landed at one of these and lived in a garden of delights for many years. Nor is this all. These western seeds were claimed as the wellspring and fountainhead of intellectual culture. Doubtless much of what we call mythic fable is but symbolism or allegory, divine influences clad in anthropomorphic robes, or philosophic sequence given in the form of narrative. But sharply and clearly from the mists of mythos and legend stands forth the story of Atlantis. Its pragmatic truthfulness is evinced by the choice of Solon, who selected it as the subject of an epopee as well as by the solemnity and eagerness with which the story is brought forward by Plato as an ancient and family heirloom. Even so grave a writer as Strabo is of opinion that what Plato relates of the Atlantis is no mere invention, and the priests of Sais themselves confessed that the antiquity of Egypt 
pale before that of the Atlantids, who invaded Egypt in arms and sowed the seeds of its earliest cultivation. Atlantis was the daughter of Atlas, but Atlas had also a daughter named Merope, whence the Meropes, or speaking men, looking on language or articulate speech as the sign and token of civilized humanity. Mercury himself, the god of eloquence and persuasion, appears in the Theogony of old Rome as the grandson of Atlas. With Ovid he is Atlantiades, and Atlantis Pleonesque Nepos. So also Horace, as witness, his ode commencing, Mercury facunde nepos Atlantis, qui feros cultus hominum recentum, vosse formasticatus. Compare also in this connection Logos with Lego. In the beginning was the word. Thus also Dante, non regionam dilor, and Hamlet speaks of the brute that wants discourse of reason. Circe appears in the Odyssey as Theos, a sacred divinity, but with a special attribute of theesa, or gifted with articulate speech. Our word dumb is the analogue of the Teutonic dum, which signifies witless, and in the same spirit the slaves superciliously denote their German neighbours by a term signifying voiceless or without words. A similar meaning is attached to the Greek Nipios, whose analysis presents the same results. Later, writers place the Meropes on the Nile, but the old home of the Atlantids was the Atlas Range in western Africa. Even in Pliny's time, they had not advanced further eastward than Libya. The story of Atlantis appears in the Timaeus of Plato in the following shape. Quote, Listen now, Socrates, to a story very strange indeed, yet in every respect true, as it was once related by Solon, the wisest of the seven sages. He was the kinsman and intimate friend of our great-grandfather Tropides, as he himself often tells us in his poems. And he informed our grandfather Critias, as the old man himself in turn told us, that this state, Athens, had formerly achieved great and admirable actions, the knowledge of which had nevertheless been lost through lapse of time and the decay of mankind, one act in particular being more illustrious than the rest, in remembrance of which it were fitting that we should not only return you thanks, but also in full assembly him forth to the goddess our true and just acclaim of praise. I will acquaint you with that ancient story which I indeed received from no mere youth, for at that time Critias, as he himself said, was almost ninety years old, and I myself about ten. In Egypt, said he, in the delta, about the summit of which the streams of the Nile are divided, is the district, Nomos, surnamed Saitic, the chief city of which is Sais, whence also came the king, Amasis, and it had a presiding divinity whose name is in the Egyptian tongue Nath, which they say corresponds with the Greek Athena, and the people professed to be great friends of the Athenians and united with them in a sort of close alliance. Solon said that on his arrival thither he was very honourably received, and especially on his inquiring about ancient affairs of those priests who possessed superior knowledge in such matters, he perceived that neither himself nor any one of the Greeks, so to speak, had any antiquarian knowledge at all, and once on a time desirous of inducing them to narrate their ancient stories, he undertook to describe those events which had formerly happened among us in days of yore, those about the first Veronius and Niobe, and again after the deluge of Deucalion and Pyrrha, how they survived together with their posterity, paying due attention to the different ages in which these events are said to have occurred, on which one of their extremely ancient priests exclaimed, Solon, you Greeks are always children, and aged Greek there is none.
You are all youths in intelligence, for you hold no ancient opinions derived from remote tradition, nor any system of discipline that can boast of a hoary old age. And the cause of this is the multitude and variety of destruction that have been and will be undergone by the human race. The greater indeed arising from fire and water, others of less importance from ten thousand other contingencies. The truth is, however, that in all places where there is neither intense cold nor immoderate heat, the race of man is always found to exist, sometimes in less, sometimes in greater number, and all the noble, great, or otherwise distinguished achievements performed either by ourselves or by you, or elsewhere of which we have heard the report, all these have been engraved in our temples in very remote times, and preserved to the present day, while on the contrary, with you and all other nations, they are only just committed to writing and all other modes of transmission which states require, when again, at the usual period, a current from heaven rushes on them like a pestilence, and leaves the survivors among you both destitute of literary attainments and unacquainted with music, and thus you become young again, as at first, knowing nothing of the events of ancient times, either in our country or yours. As to the things, Solon, which you have just related from your antiquities, they differ indeed but little from puerile fables. For in the first place you mention only one deluge of the earth, whereas there have been many before. And in the next place you are unacquainted with that most noble and excellent race of men who once inhabited your country, from whom you and your whole present state are descended, though only a small remnant of this admirable people is now remaining, your ignorance in this matter resulting from the fact that their posterity for many generations died without speaking to posterity by writing. For long before the chief deluge, a city of Athenians existed, regulated by the best laws, both in military and all other matters, whose noble deeds and civil institutions are said to have been the most excellent of all that we have heard to exist under heaven. Many and mighty deeds of your state, then, are here recorded in writing, in our sacred records, and call forth your admiration, nevertheless. There is one in particular which in magnitude and valour surpasses them all. For these writings relate what a prodigious force your city once overcame when a mighty warlike power, rushing from the Atlantic Sea, spread itself with hostile fury over all Europe and Asia. That sea, indeed, was then navigable and had an island fronting that mouth which you in your tongue call the Pillars of Hercules and this island was larger than Libya and Asia put together, and there was a passage hence for travellers of that day to the rest of the islands, as well as from those islands to the whole opposite continent, which surrounds that, the real sea. For as respects what is within the mouth here mentioned, it appears to be a bay with a kind of narrow entrance, and that sea is indeed a true sea, and the land that entirely surrounds it may truly and most correctly be called a continent. In this Atlantic island, then, was formed a powerful league of kings, who subdued the entire island together with many others, and parts also of the continent, besides which they subjected to their rule parts of Libya as far as Egypt, and Europe also as far as Tyrrhenia. The whole of this force, then, being collected in a powerful league, undertook at one blow to enslave both your country and ours, and all the land besides, that lies within the mouth. This was the period, Solon, when the power of your state was universally celebrated for its virtue and strength, for surpassing all others, both in magnanimity and military skill, sometimes taking the lead of the Greek nation, at others left to itself by the defection of the rest, 
and brought into the most extreme danger, it still prevailed, raised the trophy over its assailants, kept from slavery those not as yet enslaved, ensured likewise the most ample liberty for all of us, without exception, who dwell within the pillars of Hercules. Subsequently, however, through violent earthquakes and deluges which brought desolation in a single day and night, the whole of your warlike race was at once merged under the earth, and the Atlantic island itself was plunged beneath the sea and entirely disappeared, whence even now the sea is neither navigable nor to be traced out, being blocked up by the great depth of mud which the subsiding island produced. The above, O Socrates, is the sum of what the elder Critias repeated from the narration of Solon. End quote. Thus far the Timaeus. In the Critias, Plato enters upon a more minute description of the island. The speaker here is a Greek. In the Timaeus, it was an Egyptian. It is Critias himself who thus discourses. Quote, First of all, then, let us recollect that it is about nine thousand years since war was proclaimed between those dwelling outside the pillars of Hercules and all those within them, which war we must now describe. Of the latter party, then, this city was the leader and conducted the whole war, and of the former the kings of the Atlantic island, which we said was once larger than Libya and Asia, but now sunk by earthquakes a mass of impervious mud, which hinders all those sailing on the vast sea from effecting a passage hither. As we remarked at first concerning the allotment of the gods, that they distributed the whole earth here into larger and there into smaller portions, procuring for themselves temples and public sacrifices, so Poseidon in particular, taking as his lot the Atlantic island, begat children by a mortal woman, and settled in some such spot of the island as we are about to describe. Towards the sea, but in the centre of the whole island, was a plain, which is said to have been the fairest of all plains, and distinguished for the excellence of its soil. Near this plain, and at its centre about fifty stadia distant, was a mountain with short acclivities. On this dwelt one of these men, who in primitive times sprang from the earth by name Evanor, who lived with a wife, Leucipe, and they had an only daughter, Cleto. Now, when this girl arrived at marriageable age, and her father and mother were dead, Poseidon, becoming enamoured, made her his mistress, and circularly enclosed the hill on which she dwelt, forming the sea and land into alternate zones, greater and less, turning, as it were, two out of land and three out of sea, from the centre of the island, all equally distant, so as to be inaccessible to men. For at that time ships and navigation were not known, and he himself, with his divine power, agreeably adorned the centre of the island, causing two fountains of water to shoot upwards from beneath the earth, one cold and the other hot, and making every variety of food to spring abundantly from the earth. He also begat and brought up five twin male children, and after distributing all the Atlantic island into ten parts, he bestowed on the first-born of the eldest pair his mother's dwelling and the allotment about it, this being the largest and best, and he appointed him king of all the rest, making the others governors, and giving to each the dominion over many people and an extensive territory. He likewise gave all of them names, to the eldest, who was the king, the name of Atlas, from whom, as the first sovereign, both the island and sea were termed Atlantic, and to the twin born after him, who had received for his share the extreme parts of the island towards the pillars of Hercules, as far as the region which now in that country is called Gadeirica, he gave the name which in Greek is called Eumelus, but in the language of that country Gadeirus. All these then, and their descendants, dwelt for many generations as rulers in the Sea of Islands, and as we before said, yet further extended their empire to all the country as far as Egypt and Tyrrhenia. By far the most distinguished, however, was the race of Atlas, and among these the oldest king in succession, 
always handed down the power to his eldest son many possessions indeed accrued to them through their power from foreign countries but the greatest part of what they stood in need was provided for them by the island itself first such ores as are dug out of mines in a solid state or require smelting and especially that metal oricalcum which is now known only by name but formerly of high celebrity was dug out of the earth in many parts of the island being considered the most valuable of all the metals then known except gold and it produced an abundance of wood for builders and furnished food also for tame and wild animals moreover there were comprised within it vast numbers of elephants for there were abandoned means of support for all animals that feed in marshes and lakes and mountains and plains and so likewise for this animal which by nature is the largest and most voracious of all besides these whatever odorous plants the earth now bears whether roots or grass or woods or distilling gums or flowers or fruits these it bore and produced them to perfection and yet further it bore cultivated fruits and dry edible fruits such as we use for food all these kinds of food we call vegetables together with all that trees bear as drinks meats and ointments and those also whose fruits such as acorns being used in sport and pleasure are with difficulty hoarded up together with certain dainty fruits for dessert that might provoke the satiated palate or please the seek all this that once existing and warmly acclimated island bore sacred beautiful wonderful and infinite in quantity receiving all this then from the earth the inhabitants employed themselves also in erecting temples royal habitations ports and docks over the whole region the temple of poseidon himself was a stadium in length three plethora in breadth and of a height to correspond having something of a barbaric appearance all the outside of the temple except the pinnacles they lined with silver but the pinnacles with gold and as to the interior the roof was formed wholly of ivory variegated with gold and oricalcum they also placed in it golden statues the god himself being represented as standing on a chariot holding the reins of six winged horses of such a size as to touch the roof with his head and round him a hundred nereids on dolphins and it contained also many other statues dedicated to private individuals round the outside of the temple likewise golden images were placed of all the men and women that were descended from the ten kings and many other large statues both of kings and private people both from the city itself and the foreign countries over which they had dominion there was an altar too of corresponding size and workmanship with these ornaments and the excellence of the palace was proportioned to the magnitude of the government and also to the order observed in the sacred ceremonies next they used fountains both from the cold and hot springs of which there was a great abundance either of which was wonderfully well adapted for use from its sweetness and excellence and round them they fixed their habitations and excellently watered plantations together with their water tanks some open to the heaven but other for winter use roofed over for warm baths on crossing the three exterior harbours one was met by a wall which went completely round and enclosed in one the entrance to the canal and the entrance to the sea the whole of this part indeed was covered with many and densely crowded dwellings and the canal and largest harbour were full of vessels and merchants coming from all parts causing from their multitude all kinds of shouting tumult and din all day long and night through the whole region was said to be exceedingly lofty and precipitous towards the sea and the plain about the city which encircles it is itself surrounded by mountains sloping down to the sea being level and smooth all much extended three thousand stadia in one direction and the central part of the sea above two thousand and this district of the whole island was turned toward the south the mountains around it too 
were at that time celebrated as exceeding in number size and beauty all those of the present time having in them many hamlets enriched with villages as well as rivers lakes and marshes furnishing ample supplies of food for all cattle both tame and wild with timber of various descriptions and in abundant quantity for every individual purpose the plain then being thus by nature was improved as follows by many kings in a long course of time it was of square shape mostly straight and oblong and where it ended they bounded it by a trench dug round it the depth breadth and length of which for a work of man's making besides the other connected undertakings we can scarcely believe though still we must report that we heard it was excavated to the depth of a plethrum and the breadth was a stadium in every part the whole excavation round the plain being ten thousand stadia in length this receiving the streams coming down from the mountains and conducted all round the plain approached the city in some parts and in this way was allowed to flow out to the bay from above likewise straight canals were cut about a hundred feet broad along the plain back into the ditch near the sea distant from another about one hundred stadia and it was by this that they brought down the timber from the mountains to the city and carried on the rest of their shipping traffic cutting transverse canals of communication into each other and towards the city their harvest also they gathered twice in the year in winter availing themselves of the rains and in summer introducing on the land the streams from the trenches as to the quantity of land it was ordered that of the men on the plain fit for service each individual leader should have his allotment each allotment amounted in extent to a hundred stadia and the total of the lots being sixty thousand and of those from the mountains and the rest of the country there was said to be an incalculable number of men to all of whom according to their dwelling and villages were assigned certain lots by their respective leaders to each leader likewise the task was appointed of furnishing for war the sixth portion of a war chariot to make up a total of ten thousand two riding horses and a two-horse car without a driver's seat having a mounted charioteer to direct the horses with another to dismount and fight at the side also two heavy-armed soldiers two archers two slingers three each of light-armed men stone shooters and javelin men with four sailors to make up a complement of one thousand two hundred ships thus were the military affairs of this city arranged and as respects the nine others there were different other arrangements which it would be tedious to narrate and as respects official situations and honours the following were the arrangements made for the commencement of the ten kings each individual in his own district and over his own city ruled supreme over the people and the laws constraining and punishing whomsoever he pleased and the government and commonwealth in each was regulated by the injunctions of poseidon as the law handed them down and inscriptions were made by the first kings on a column of auriculcum which was deposited in the centre of the island in the temple of poseidon where they assembled every fifth year which they afterwards changed to every sixth year taking an equal part both for the entire state and its supernumeraries and thus collected they consulted concerning the common will and inquired what transgressions each had committed judging them accordingly such then and so great being the power at that time in these places the deity transferred it these regions as report goes on the following pretexts for many generations as long as the natural power of the god sufficed them they remained obedient to the laws and kindly affected towards the divine nature to which they were allied but when the divine portion within them became extinct through much and frequent admixture of the mortal nature and the manners of men began to hold sway then through inability to bear present events they began to exhibit unbecoming conduct and to the intelligent beholder appeared base destroying the fairest among their most valuable possessions 
Zeus, however, the god of gods, who ruled according to the laws, and is able to see into such things, perceiving an honourable race in a condition of wretchedness, and wishing to inflict punishment on them that they might become more diligent in the practice of temperance, collected all the gods into their own most ancient habitation, which indeed being situate in the centre of the whole world beholds all things, and having assembled them, he said, End quote. Thus abruptly ends the Critias. If completed, the termination has been lost. The extracts from this dialogue and from the Timaeus will sufficiently show the form which the mythos had then assumed. Such is the narrative which has served as a text for the learned labours of Bailey, Rudbeck, Kircher, Beckham, Buffon, Whitehurst, and others. It might seem superfluous to revive the discussion of this vexata questio, already handled by writers of acknowledged eminence, but the ever-widening circle of human knowledge permits to all to supplement or illustrate, however imperfectly, the speculations of those who have gone before, and the recent investigations in relation to the Basques and their language, the deep-sea soundings of the Atlantic, and the amber fauna of Central Europe seemed to present in this connection some points of interest worthy of consideration. End of part one. Part two of the Lost Island of Atlantis by E. T. Fletcher. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Lost Island of Atlantis. Part two. The island of which Plato discoursed and Pindar sang has indeed long since passed away, and its memory has become enshrouded in the mists of poetry and fable. The very echoes of its story have well nigh died into silence. Scarcely can we realize the remoteness of its existence. The scale of our own chronology shrinks to a point and the effort to scan with any certainty the secrets of that abyss of time seems in its futile presumption alike profitless and vain yet if traces are anywhere left of the sacred isle and its tenants it would appear reasonable to expect them on the borders of the north atlantic on the edge of that sea of marvels and mysteries still called by the arabs the sea of darkness whose surges once broke upon their shores there yet remains on the eastern strand of the atlantic a people isolated from all others standing ethnologically alone and having no affinity with the existing families of nations strange and solitary as some old-world denizen of the saurian age that had lived on through many geological cycles outliving its fellows and congeners to confront at last the widely dissimilar types of contemporary being such is the Euskarian people, the Escaldunac or Basques, the lineal descendants of the ancient Iberians, who, in their turn, standing similarly apart from the rest of Europe, and possessing a literature which was already old in the days of Strabo, seem to represent some more ancient stock whose existence stretches far back into the grey dawn of time. The ethnologic isolation of the Basques rests mainly on linguistic grounds. Their language, the Euskara, differs widely from all others both in structure and vocabulary. Attempts have been made to connect it with the Hungarian or Magyari, with the less conspicuous Ugrian dialects of the Baltic, with the agglutinative tongues of Central Asia, and even with the surrounding Romance language or daughters of the Old Latin, but alike in vain. Like the mutable genie of the Arab tale, it eludes at every turn the grasp that would retain it. It remains an unsolvable enigma, a perpetual puzzle, a pièce de résistance for laborious continental professors. Elsewhere and with other tongues there is influence and interchange, connection and derivation. This one alone rises unconformably amidst them all like the product of an earlier formation or the mountain peak of a drowned world. There are many things that suggest its great antiquity as a language. 
the pronouns which elsewhere are for the most part irregular in declension are here regular throughout in all that great family of languages which has been called the indo-european as comprising the european congeners of the sanskrit the pronominal inflections have a broken and disjointed aspect as if made up of the fragments of earlier and dissimilar forms thus the classical ego is as different from the genitive me as is the russo sclavonic ya from its possessive menya something of an analogy is presented to the conglomerates and breccias of the geologist the cemented gravels and shell mosaics made up of portions of older rocks again the peculiar phonesis of the euskara points to a remote era its mute consonants being hard and pure unlike the aspirate and sibilant phonesis of later growths it delights in k t and p sounds and in its vocalization the pure sounds a i and u are largely predominant further as might be expected in a language that has come down to us from primeval times the few lexical affinities which can be traced are shared among widely dissimilar tongues now lying far apart on the earth's surface a few of its words are coptic rask saw a likeness to the finnish william von humboldt traced a resemblance to attic greek old in years its vitality as well as the extent of its original area must have been great to enable it to resist influences which would have been fatal to a dialect less old less widely spoken or less firmly implanted during the entire middle ages it was never a written language less deeply rooted it would have disappeared altogether receding everywhere it still lives within the last thirty years it has lost eight leagues of territory in spanish navarre alone yet it still endures an ancient oak with little but the stem remaining the old forms are still preserved among these are some which seem analogous to those of eastern lands to the karmadaraya compounds of the sanskrit where two words a noun and its attribute for instance are so closely united that the latter only is subject to change or inflection the former remaining in its crude form and both together being fused into one inseparable compound in the sanskrit this fusing together of words is carried to a startling extent particularly in the class of descriptives or epithetics known as bahuvrihi compounds thus in speaking of a certain river an epithet is applied to it consisting of one compound word which word signifies whose waters were sanctified by the bathing of the daughter of yanaka again the euskarian radices or roots themselves are of a confessedly antique type monosyllabic aerial untranslatable in themselves fulfilling no specific grammatical function but conveying the central abstract idea whence as from a vitalizing germ radiate the forms of all inflectional and conjugational bases it is scarce necessary to revert to the fact that all language has three determinate stages first the monosyllabic represented by the chinese where as bunsen had expressed it quote, every word is a magnetized mineral forming itself without any outward change into polarity the nominal and the verbal pole and thus having for its centre as the indifferential point between the two the adjective participle quality position assisted by accent elicits the polarity required or reduces the word to its indifferential point the chinese expresses daylight by two words signifying it exactly the same order day light but he cannot condescend to subordinate the second to the first by saying with one accent daylight if he could the spell of monosyllabism would be broken End quote the slowness of mutation here approaches that of the great cosmical changes of the universe it is only after a literature of four thousand years that some of these unchangeable chinese roots are beginning to be used as signs of grammatical relations 
in the second or agglutinative stage something of a crystallization has taken place among these isolated centres of thought and polysyllabic words have been formed the tone syllable constituting the axis as it were around which the others are built up thus forming one organism out of many syllables in the final or inflectional stage comprising the semitic and aryan groups the material and formative parts of a word are fused together so intimately as to be not always distinguishable speaking in general terms the second division may be said to be represented by the great turanian family of languages holding the main land of the great asiatic continent while the peninsulas of Europe and India are Aryan, and that of Arabia is Semitic. The first or isolating class, with its many centres of life and its polyp-like diffused vitality, may be not inaptly compared to the radiate division of the animal world, while the articulata may afford an analogue to the Turanian class, where syllable is agglutinated to syllable by an almost vegetative process of development. At the head of the sporadic Turanian dialects of Europe has been provisionally placed the Euskarian or Basque. But the Turanianism of the Basque differs widely from that of its supposed nearest congeners, the Finnish and Hungarian these latter have a peculiar euphonic system in virtue of which hard and soft vowels cannot stand together in the same word and when a vocalized affix is added to a stem word having a vowel or vowels of an opposite class a species of umlaut takes place and the vowel of the affix is conformed to the vocalization of the stem word the same principle appears abundantly elsewhere as for example in the plural of icelandic verbs and nouns and throughout the mesa gothic of ulfilas nothing of this kind is to be found in the basque either in the modern improvisations of the escaldunac peasant or in those venerable war songs which bridging the gulf of many centuries relate the struggles of their ancestors the indomiti cantabri of horace with the armed legionaries of rome nor is it altogether unworthy of observation that there is in the character of the basque literature that which hints at the effete civilization of a most ancient people literatures like men grow old old in an irrepressible sadness in something of bitterness and sarcasm in that keen appreciation of men and things which is derived from commerce from crowded intercourse from long experience alone the oldest utterance is lyrical and from the vedaic hymns to the sententiousness of worldly wise proverbs is a transition from infancy to declining years to revert from the contortions of rose-tinted sentimentalism which stamp the anility of a people to the heimskringler or the fresh sagas of the north is to exchange the unwholesome air of a theatre for the clear beauty of the morning even below the throbbing life pulse and muscular vitality of homer himself we detect a despondency not unnatural in one who receiving the last echoes of lydian song and yielding a language already perfect with the growth of centuries may be said to stand at the close of a cycle rather than at the beginning such in its main attributes is the literature of the basques such in particular is that of the laborden branch as collected by francisque michel sententious artistic sombre in tone and rich in proverbs and apothegms of a most shrewd and practical wisdom whence then did these people originate thus old thus different from all others and cut off on the east by an impassable chasm of unrelated dialects whence did they come or by what path did they reach their present home may we believe that they came from the west from some insular tract in the north atlantic were there at first two opposing centres of civilization and was the shock of their meeting dimly shadowed forth in the story of the timaeus and commemorated by the panathenaic procession wherein the peplus of the goddess depicted the defeat of titans and the people returned thanks for their preservation from western invaders 
the Saturnian dynasty opposed to that of Jove, the war of the giants and the gods, Odin destroying Ymir and his offspring, have these a historic basis? Were it in our powers to look back from some Pisgah hide on the long march of those who have preceded us, we might perhaps see how successive races as waves of the sea have swept over and renewed the face of the civilized world. Could our vision penetrate the mists of the morning, we might see how progress has alternated with retrogression and how each ebbing wave has left the depopulated earth to return to the silence and desolation of its primeval forests. For decay is rapid as growth, and the traces of civilization are soon lost when the foot of the civilizer is withdrawn. It was thus that in Italy, during the days of Belisarius and Narsus, in France under the early Valois, and in Belgium after the return of the Spanish provinces to the sway of the second Philip, the farms and orchards and palatial buildings, the busy roadways, and all signs and tokens of content and prosperity, disappeared altogether, in many districts, to be replaced by the dank vegetation of fen and forest, where the bittern brooded, and the wild beast made his lair. Do these various mythi, then, all converging to one point, receive additional confirmation from other and independent sources? Are these physical grounds to corroborate Straber's opinion, that the island of Atlantis had an actual existence, and that the narrative of Plato is not all a dream? End of Part 2 Part three of the Lost Island of Atlantis by E. T. Fletcher. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Lost Island of Atlantis, Part three. Let us advert for a moment to the fossil flora of the brown coal formation of Germany and the mollusks of Switzerland, both tertiary formations belonging to the Miocene age, as investigated by Professor Unger of Vienna. The professor remarks on the amazing number of analogues which these fossils present to those of the flora of the northern states of America, and shows that many of these strikingly resemble the trees and shrubs of the cis-Atlantic continent. Thus the magnificent North American tulip tree, the Liriodendron tulipiferum of Linnaeus, finds a representative in the Swiss mollus as also in Iceland, where both the leaves and fruit of the Liriodendron of Unger have been discovered. So the fruits and seeds of Pavia and Robinia, found here and there in the brown coal, show that these genera, now limited in America to a very inconsiderable area, formerly lived and flourished in Europe, where they are now looked on as exotics, and, being introduced as such into gardens, are again naturalized in their primal home. Again, the nut is notoriously wanting in Europe, for the almost naturalized walnut is from the forest ridges of the southern Caucasus, but the nut fruit is found most abundantly in the brown coal, and, if these specimens be compared with the numerous American species, the resemblance will be found most striking, in particular, if the so-called grain out of America, the Jungland cinerea of Linnaeus, be compared with the fossil Juglans de Frodes of Unger, it will be found difficult, if not impossible, to detect any difference. It is remarkable, too, that while this connection exists with the flora of the Western world, the plants of the neighboring eastern continent are very sparingly represented in Europe. Besides the instances of close resemblance already given, the professor has appended a lengthy list of other analogues from which the following are extracted. In the European tertiaries, the fossil Nyssa ornithobroma agrees with the American Nyssa aquatica, the Taxodium dubium with the Taxodium disticum the Platanus aceroides with the Platanus occidentalis, the Austria atlantidis with the Austria virginica, the Acer trilobatum with the Acer rubrum and the Acer dasicarpum, the Cersis radoboyana with the Cersis canadensis, the Laurus 
primigenia with the Loras canariensis, the Rhododendron megiston, Unger, with the Rhododendron maximum, Linnaeus, the Bumelia pleiadum with the Bumelia tenax. The genus Quercus presents no less than eight fossil species, the Tephrodes, Chlorophylla, Elaina, Myrtiloides, Apollinis, Drimea, Lonchitis, and Daphnis, which answer respectively to the species Cineria, Virens, Oleoides, Myrtifolia, Lorifolia, Xalapensis, Lancifolia, and Aquatica of the American continent. In the same way, the fossil Prunus has two species, the Ilex II, the Rus III, and the Pinus XIV, all possessing exact analogues in Northern America. Further, Professor Hare's examination of the fossil plants of the island of Madeira show the following parallelism with the fossils of the European tertiaries. Woodwardia rosneriana in the tertiary flora of Europe Woodwardia radicans in the Atlantic flora of Madeira, Pteris goperti, Pteris arguta, Aspidium elongatum, Aspidium affine, Cheilanthes laharpi, Cheilanthes fragrans, Myrica salicina, Myrica faya, Linnaeus, Persia brauni, Persia indica, Loris princeps, Loris canariensis, Clethra teutonica, Clethra alnifolia, Olea osiris, Olea excelsa, Salix variens, Salix canariensis. Thus, an interesting link of connection is supplied to the two great floras first considered. On looking at the permanent character of the North American vegetation, which seems to have changed but little since the Mollus period, whereas that of the brown coal has a character of exoticism and isolation, Professor Unger is led to the opinion that the Bildungscentrum, the creative center of the latter, is the southern part of the North American Free States. From this center has America distributed to Europe its descendant Robinia, its amber and tulip trees, its nuts, its maples, and so forth. As to the mode of transmission, there are but two cases possible. Either the winged and wingless seeds and scions have been transported through the air or by the ocean to the western shores of Europe, or a bridge of connection then existed which has been since destroyed. As to the air-traveling seeds, it is well known that these, either from their winged type or by the intervention of birds, frequently attain a considerable range of dispersion, but in no case a distance equal to the breadth of the Atlantic. Travelling by water, it has been no uncommon thing for plants to migrate from one continent to another. There are cosmopolites which the Gulf Stream has brought from the coast of Mexico to Norway. It is to the ocean that the coconut palm owes its great range of extension. Not only does it travel well, but when thrown upon shoal or rock, if it find only a little poor white sand which would support nothing else, the coconut contents itself there, finds brackish water not a jot less agreeable than the freshest, germinates, thrives, grows into a robust cocoa tree. A tree being thus planted, fresh water comes, falling leaves create earth, other trees follow and at length we see the noble palm grove which arrests the vapours. These eventually form a rivulet or river, which, flowing from the centre of the isle, make an opening of fresh water in the cincture of white sand, and thus keep the polyps, inhabitants only of salt water, at a respectful distance. Thus an island has grown up amid the ocean. But in reference to these modes of transmission, it may be observed that the plants so diffused are few in number, and the range of operation is for the most part limited. In fact, how little the sea is adapted for a medium of transportation has been shown by the researches of Darwin, Berkeley, Salter, and Alphonse de Candolle. 
According to the latter, of 98 species which were submitted to the experiment, only 19 retained the faculty of germination after a six weeks immersion in sea water, and after being immersed for three months, all with the exception of seven had either sunk and so become incapable of further migration, or had lost the power of reproduction but the richness and variety of the brown coal and mollas flora are adverse to the supposition of any such mode of migration as those above indicated in that insular period when europe itself existed only as a group of islands the outlines of the water basins and arms of the sea being indicated pretty accurately by the configuration of the brown coal deposits and when the eastern coast of the north american states judging from the deep sea soundings and the wearing effect of the gulf stream extended in all probability much further eastward into the atlantic if we look at the peculiar vegetation of madeira and bear in mind the fossil plants of iceland which though now bare and treeless was then thickly wooded with a flora analogous to that of the brown coal we cannot doubt that some vast insular tract existed at this time in the north atlantic extending probably from iceland in the north to madeira in the south and forming a bridge of connection between the two worlds at a meeting of German naturalists at Königsberg in 1861, a lecture was delivered by Director Löw on the diptera of the amber fauna. In this fauna, the perfect preservation of even the smaller and more delicate animal organisms allows of a minute comparison with their existing analogues. After showing their agreement with various North American species and expressing a decided opinion that the existing intercourse between the two continents is not sufficient to account for the large number of species common to both, the director concludes, quote, The European and the American Dipterous faunae always appear to me like two branches of the same stock each having had a development of its own, very similar, however, to the development of the other. But if there really was such a common stock for both, it is to be sought among the diptera of a former geological period, and if the European and the North American dipteris faunae are to be considered as branches of this stock, the necessary inference would be that at a former period Europe and America had a continental connection. Are the amber diptera preserved fragments of this common stock? Did a continental connection between Europe and America really exist at the time when they lived? Did the submersion of an Atlantis tear asunder the branches of this stock? Was this catastrophe accompanied by changes which modify the general laws of development of the common stock in such a manner as to produce a difference between the further development of the stronger American branch and of the weaker European one, a difference not excluding at the same time a great deal of analogy? End quote. It is possible that, when investigations now going on are completed, a still stronger argument may be drawn from the European and American hymenoptera, a family less capable of dispersion or migration, to which the sea would be an almost insuperable barrier. End of part three. Part four of The Lost Island of Atlantis by E. T. Fletcher. The Slibrivox recording is in the public domain. The Lost Island of Atlantis, Part four. The operations of Dr. Morey in the North Atlantic Ocean afford a remarkable confirmation of the hypothesis adduced. His deep sea soundings show that a raised tract, suggestive of a submerged island, which he calls the middle ground, lies midway in the Atlantic basin, extending from the latitude of Cuba to beyond Newfoundland, and having a breadth of from 20 to 30 degrees of longitude. The soundings of this plateau, which is of clay and sand, are from 1,000 to 1,800 fathoms. All around, immediately beyond its outline, the sea goes plumb down another thousand fathoms, and beyond this lower terrace there is another descent, where the Atlantic attains its greatest depth of about five thousand fathoms. Neither is it necessary, if the existence of such an island be conceded, that the age of the human race be carried back to the period of the Miocene. The island, possibly, did not sink beneath the waters before the close of the Pleistocene or Drift period. 
the various terraces round the highest level plainly point to an area of subsidence. There were sinking at distant intervals, with long ages of rest between. It was not probably till the end of the Pliocene that the island was reduced to its most limited extent and subsequently became the abode of man. The old legends retained by Plato speak of terrible convulsions of nature amid which Atlantis sank. Can we suppose these narratives to retain a far distant echo of the throes and disturbances which preceded the modern geologic period? Without doubt, if we review in thought the many ages that must have rolled away since the period of the Pleistocene, it may appear startling to conceive of man as then existing, and to compute the duration of our species on earth by thousands of centuries instead of the few thousand years usually assigned to it. But there are many considerations which would incline to the belief that the antiquity of our race has been greatly underrated. The whole tendency of contemporary scientific inquiry sets in that direction. And year by year, as book after book appears and discovery after discovery is made, the genesis of man recedes, and the date of his appearance seems further and further withdrawn. Worthy of note, too, is the great number of recorded changes and convulsions of the earth's surface, too numerous and too considerable to be comprised within the received historic period nor are these given as mere myths by authors little deserving of credit but as historic events handed down by tradition and placed on record by writers not wholly devoid of critical acumen as strabo herodotus and others strong and indelible must have been the memory of the disturbances wherein the agencies of water floods earthquakes and subterraneous upheaving seem to have been alternately employed it has been the parent of many myths wherein superhuman beings have been represented in deadly warfare the samothracian priests had a tradition that the pontus was originally a closed crater and that afterwards overflowing it formed the hellespont as its outlet and separated europe from africa that these two were at first one continent seems supported by the great similarity of the floras on the northern and southern shores of the mediterranean Crete is said to have formerly been part of the mainland, and in no other way does it seem possible to account for the presence of its mountain peaks of the Capra Sinaica, whose special habitat is between Sinai and Nubia. The island of Rhodes arose from the sea, and was subsequently inundated. Kos and Niceros, originally one, were rent asunder and formed two islands. The valleys of the Thessalian Pineus and the Laconian Eurotas were dried up. Cyprus, Euboea, and Sicily were violently separated from the mainland. Mountain tops were cast down as that of Taygetus. Earthquakes overthrew cities as Sparta and Sicyon, or covered them with the waves as the Boeotian Arni and Media and the Achaean Hellas and Bura. Islands were torn asunder as Theresia and Thera, or wholly submerge, as Crissy near Lemnus. Capus, as Atalanta, were changed into islands, while others again were thrown up from the depths of the sea, as Hiera and Thea. Rivers were dried up, as the Boeotian Helios, or volcanoes suddenly blazed forth, as on Lemnus, the Arcadian Lycium, and Methoni in Argolis. The changes of the Caspian had given rise to the learned monograph of Cephalides, the Historia Maris Caspi, scarcely two ancient writers agreeing as to its extent, form, or position, or as to the names, number, and course of the rivers which it receives. Nor are Oriental authorities wanting. The Chevalier von Norov, in a treatise published at St. Petersburg in 1854, has collected on the subject some curious extracts from Arab writers on the 10th century. One of these, Masudi, A.D., 943-944, speaks of an old tradition that a bridge formerly existed at the strait between Spain and Africa, constructed of stones and bricks, over which passed camels and beasts of burden. Under this bridge flowed the ocean tide, divided into small canals. 
The water of the Mediterranean, however, rose gradually, and in course of time submerged one tract after another. Finally the water flowed over the bridge, which, however, could be seen below the surface long after by seafaring men. Another similar tradition, preserved by El Biruni, is that in old time a damp, brackish soil, covered with rank vegetation, extended between Egypt and Constantinople. Neither again, according to the ordinary chronology, would there seem to be space enough for the evolution of all the multitudinous mythi of antiquity. These mythi are the deposit of long ages of a people's history. It can be only after a great lapse of time that the suspended matter of a mythos, be it historic, religious, or physical, becomes at length precipitated, or rather slowly deposited, and assumes a concrete and palpable form. There may be those who think that the fossils, the cave relics, and other signs and evidences of man's primeval occupancy should be yet more numerous to warrant any certain conclusion. To these it may be replied that the ocean bed is beyond the grasp of the geologists, that scarcely a tenth of the whole dry land has been surveyed, and of that tenth but a small part belongs to the tertiary or post-tertiary age. And what indeed can be more reasonable than to suppose that when the earth was prepared for his reception, man should appear? In those primal Azoic ages, when as yet the dry land was not, and our planet rolled onward through the void, covered with a boiling sea and shrouded in vapours, so that emphatically darkness was on the face of the deep, then, of course, his existence would have been an impossibility." So also, during the time when those strange ganoids and placoids held their solitary sway, or later, when the dynasty of fishes was succeeded by that of reptiles, and the leas and oolite displayed their wondrous reptilian fauna. But at the close of the secondary period, there was a pause, a pause of expectancy. The crowning glory of creation, the centre of the mute prophesying of innumerable ages, man, the latest born and highest of terrestrial creatures was about to appear. With the tertiary a new order of things arises. It has been said that it possesses scarcely a species in common with the preceding age, that two planets would hardly differ more in their natural productions, and this break in the law of continuity is the more remarkable as hitherto some of the newly created animals were always introduced before the older was extinguished it was a period of rest and tranquillity an exultant and abounding age creatures of a high order the largest of the land mammalia moved through the luxuriant herbage or enjoyed the shady coolness of the riverside and still with the ever-widening dawn, the resemblance to our own world increased. The stately ruminants of the forest, the elk, the stag, and the bison appeared. The horse waited for his rider, and the steer for the yoke of the husbandman. Flowers, like our own, enameled a thousand fields, and the lark, as now, filling the air with song, soared upward to the gates of heaven." And thus, the conditions of vitality being there, it is difficult to conceive of life itself being absent. Everything around us, the blade of grass, the drop of dew, teems with living beings. Life is enjoyed everywhere to the uttermost. There is no space lost, and not only is life present, but life advanced to the furthest degree of perfection which the supplied conditions will allow the elements being given, the organism is the unfailing product, and the Promethean spark kindles at once into being. If human life then was possible during this period, we may rest assured that human life was there. And they, the dwellers in their island home, how lived they? What was their history? May we believe with Plato that they became prosperous, rich, powerful, were ruled by wise kings, received tribute from the neighboring islands, and had long years vouchsafed to them of peace and plenty. And finally, after sending out migratory swarms eastward, and perhaps westward, how did their island disappear? Was it submerged slowly? Or did it sink suddenly in ruin? We cannot tell. 
all is dark and uncertain yet with the onward march of science the day may perhaps come when its historic actuality will be made plain as the fact of its geological existence whatever the power and greatness of the old atlantids all now is vanished as a dream lost and engulfed in a barren wilderness of waters festivals processions the meetings in the marketplace and uproar of congregated thousands all is silent now the ocean keeps its secret summer and winter sleet and sunshine pass over its surface but no sound or echo comes to tell of the sleepers below yet here haply were human affections and friendships and all the incidents and realities of life and when the suddenness of desolation fell upon them it must have been with no ordinary pang that these children of the morning resigned the rich blessings they enjoyed and descended into that darkness where as yet no teacher had gone before buried thus in the lava and scoria of volcanic action who can tell what subtle agencies of nature have since been at work who can say whether the infiltrated fluid charged with calcareous or siliceous earth in solution may not in the interval preceding the final submersion have lapidified these sleepers have turned them into stone like the fossils and reliquiae which form the study of the curious if so it may be that when in the oscillations of the earth's crust the island of atlantis covered with its subsequent deposits again rises to the surface some future geologist may lay bare the secrets of that last convulsion may gaze with reverence on the first-born of our race and again expose to air and sunshine the reveller with his rose wreath the hierarch with his staff and the mailed monarch with his sceptre and his crown End of part four. Part five of the Lost Island of Atlantis by E. T. Fletcher. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Lost Island. Silent and lonely in the summer night lay the great city. Through the marble streets no footstep moved. The palaces, the seats of wealth and power, the domes of Malachite, where sculptured dragons, monsters carved in stone, alternated with statues clear and white of ancient warrior kings that stood in rows along the Cyclopean porticoes, were hushed, and over all the moonlight shone. Along the beach, beneath the massy wall, the great sea rippled drowsily, Afar the headland glimmered like a misty star wearing a cloud wreath for a coronal, and all the air was filled with tremulous sighs born from the waste of waters, musical yet dreamy soft as some old Orphic hymn that floated up what time the day grew dim from Dorian groves and forest privacies yet in the voiceless silence of the hour an awful presence moved unseen unheard it glided onward on its way and stirred the sleepers hearts with dreams of gloomy power visions of fear and throbbings of despair the plague was here there was no house or bower save from his darts from every door had gone some friend or father some beloved one born to his grave by the red torch's glare and does a lovely flower that seems to fade in summer's heat and bows its golden head turning from those fierce heavens overspread to muse in sadness on some dewy glade so many a maiden perished white and still and many a soft angelic face that made the sunshine of its home grown cold and grey beneath the coming shadow passed away so warm of late now passionless and chill alas the little children where was now their laughter many voiced their sportive wiles their bounding feet and witchery of smiles with floating hair and faces all aglow silence and fear into their play had come 
dulling each pulse and shadowing each brow, and so they wept and wondered. Side by side lay young and old, the bridegroom and his bride, the child and sage, all summoned to one tomb. So rose at times through all the moonlit air, faint and scarce heard, like voices in a dream, low wailing sounds that told of grief supreme, the utterance of mourners gathered there. Almost it seemed that every star which set was a winged messenger to bear some human life to those unloved abodes where dwell implacable the lower gods, silent as stone, stern-eyed, with locks of jet. Fast waned the night, yet ere the morning came, the portals of the palace opened wide, the sculptured valves fell back on either side, the lamps within flashed forth the sudden flame, and swift into the dim uncertain light, which neither night nor day might wholly claim, there stepped a figure of heroic mien, fair as a goddess, stately and serene, a star-like apparition, pure and white. This was the island queen, Evane, all unattended save by one stout thrall, who followed humbly at some interval, with noiseless foot she trod the marble way. So passed she on towards the open lea that girt the town, in shadowy array, the palm trees on her right hand lifted high their crests, clear cut against the opal sky, and on her left she heard the murmuring sea. Then, as the first faint breeze of morning fanned with odorous breath her cheek incarnadine, and thrilled each leaf and flower, and crisped the brine that crept like molten silver to the strand, she halted at a wayside cottage door, a lowly hut that lay twixt sea and land, retired and peaceful as a hermitage, whose porch with orchids, blossoms of wild sage, and bright convolvuli was covered o'er. There dwelt her aged nurse, now breathing slow her life away. With hand upon the latch, the youthful queen a moment paused to watch the splendor of the morning, and the glow that deepened in the east. Across the bay she saw the hilltops kindling, while below the valleys lay in darkness. One by one, the small clouds caught the flame, and lo, the sun leaped as a giant forth, and it was day. With throbbing heart she stood, and thoughtful brow, then sighed, Alas, why in a world so fair must death have place? O oh, balmy summer air, sunshine and clouds, mountains and sea, and thou, illimitable dome of heaven above, phantoms of beauty, ever fresh as now, receive my greeting. Changeless as of old, ye still remain, when life and love are called, and the web rent which youth so fondly wove. She entered there, and in a moment stepped from life to death, from sunshine into gloom, from song of birds to stillness of the tomb, where all was silent, saving those who wept. Through the half-opened casement floated in the perfume of rare flowers. A lily crept along the sill, in drooping sympathy, the while a honeybee went humming by, and faintly came from far the city's din. Yet, as a lake's calm surface, dull and chill, is roused to wavelets by a falling stone, the sinking soul that seemed forever gone walked at the sudden footstep, and a thrill of recognition o'er the features passed. Then, with a mighty effort of strong will, she laid her hand most gently on the head of two fair children kneeling by her bed, with mute, appealing gaze. It was her last. So all was done, still shone the sun abroad, and bird and insect, butterfly and flower, basked in the glorious splendor of the hour, 
Still, through the air, like footsteps of a god, murmured the low soft wind, and all was bright. No shadow fell on these, nor were they awed, when, through their midst, a naked human soul passed, like an exhalation to its goal, a babble rising to the infinite. After a few days, the pale form laid at rest in grassy sward, beside the ocean foam, the queen set forth towards her palace home, and, not unmindful of that last bequest, took with her those two children as her own. Weeping, they left the comfortable nest, where their young life had passed its callow years, but loving hands soon wiped away their tears, and hope new-born upon their pathway shone. It was the eventide. At home once more, within her chamber sat Evanay, watching the shadows of the closing day gather and darken over sea and shore. Her soul drank deeply of the soft repose that lay on all things, so she pondered o'er the past and present, and on angels' wings her spirit rose in rapt imaginings beyond the sphere of earth and earthly woes. She sat alone. It was an antique room, lofty, not large. The cornice pearl inlaid, the floor mosaic, and the wall arrayed with tapestry whose softly shaded gloom was lit with lifelike figures passing fair the product of some long-forgotten loom. White marble forms, hunters and kings of old, stood in quaint nooks and vases of wrought gold, held richest flowers whose perfume filled the air. She thought of many a legendary rhyme, told by her nurse in the long-vanished days, when she, a child, sat listening with fixed gaze to those delightful stories of old time. Here sat she, patient on her lowly stool, and heard how, first when struck the fated chime out of the deep, like a fair lotus flower, Atlantis rose, and warmed by sun and shower, expanded, bearing all things beautiful. Thereon the gods came down and dwelt with men. Through the dim avenues of giant trees they walked conversing, or on peaceful seas sublimely trod, nor shrunk from human ken. The air was musical with song and mirth of vigorous lusty life. From glade and glen soft clouds of incense rose. The passing hours seemed garlanded with amaranthine flowers. Nor yet was pain or sorrow known on earth. How was it now? Alas, on all the land despair lay darkling, and a mournful cry went up as when a crowded argosy sinks perishing upon a rocky strand. Oh, thought she, if some god, some mighty one, should come to sweep, as with a conqueror's brand this pestilence from out the heavy air, and bring back health and joy and all things fair, him would I honour, he should share my throne. Scarce had the wish been framed when came a sound of sudden thunder muttering afar, nearer it swelled until, beneath the jar, the strong walls shook and wavered all around, a shiver ran along the marble floor, upheaving like a wave, from out the ground mysterious murmurs came, then over all darkness descended, deep, funereal, still as the grave, a sea without a shore. A sphered radiance, serene and clear, broke in upon the gloom. So softly bright it seemed some kingly star had lent its light. Whence came these accents to her startled ear? Evanay, thy vow hath brought me down, to woo and win thee as a suitor here. Fear not, within few days I come again, the plague removed, and thou shalt know me then. Lord of the winds, a Marut, son of dawn. She heard, she trembled, and her heart beat high, amazed with thoughts conflicting. Yet she stood calm and unfearing in her lion mood, fronting all chances with unquailing eye. Round her the shadows deepened. Then at last she woke from stupor and beheld the sky, 
all wild above and threatening, and the stars fast blotted out by gathering cloudy bars, and heard the hollow moaning of the blast. All night the tempest raged, adown the street, with thunder call, the mad winds raved amain. Day dawned in gloom, and went, and came again, and still the storm winds, furious and fleet, coursed on above, and sun and stars were dead. Then came a change. Again with silver feet the moonlight came and kissed each bruised flower, and morning came, and all the healing power of freshened airs and sunshine overhead. So, like a nightmare vision, passed away the pestilence and all its gloomy shows. The fourth day came to end. In hushed repose the golden gloaming faded into grey, gleaming with stars and shadows vespertine filled all the room where sad evanay then came again the god as some strong spell she felt his presence murmuring it is well my people live are saved and i am thine o oh joy o oh happiness in life's wide waste are there not days whose memory remains as of an oasis in desert plains, a reminiscence not to be effaced throughout all griefs and all the aftertime? Still through the gloom it shines, a pharaoh's placed on that far line of youth's enchanted shore, where lived we in the golden days of yore, when life was new and all things in their prime and they were happy through long sunny years the island queen and sanadon they moved in a rich atmosphere of light and roved throughout the realm like those united spheres that walk in pairs along the starry sky what time the vault of heaven unveiled appears and those two children once their grand dame's care eridion and thea grew up fair and strong and graced with gentle courtesy Joyous as summer birds, they wandered oft through regions wild and full of loveliness, through lonely places where the hum and stress of cities came not, and the air was soft with balmy odors of sweet-scented pines, where in clear blue the white clouds sailed aloft, and streams flowed on through plains or leaped in falls from rock to rock in broken intervals bordered with lotus blooms and leafy vines sometimes they went inland and visited the mountain solitudes and privacies wherein the island waters had their rise and taking thus some river at its head they drifted downwards on its placid stream passing by caverns dark and full of dread by headlands frowning vast and flowery sword, by golden sands and beds of odorous nard, and banyan groves all wondrous as a dream. Then, borne aloft in his aerial car, the Marud brought them over sea and land, towards the rising sun, beyond the strand of far Iberia. Shining like a star, old Etna raised aloft his crown of snow, and they passed onward, or the sandy bar of rocky Salmidesus, white with foam, and traversed to see the Euxine near the home of Scythians and the broad Araxes flow. Far to the north they saw the boundless plain, where roved the mammoths, where in dusky bands innumerable as the ocean sands they wandered with white tusks and shaggy mane, hugest of living beasts that looked on man so came they to a ragged mountain chain gloomy and dark a wilderness forlorn so wild it seemed the world's extremest born withered and grey with some unending ban then with a sudden lamentable cry thea exclaimed o oh, father o oh, my lord what awful shape hangs there with brow all scored as if with flame of lightning from on high, yet unsubdued and wearing as a king the garment of his silent agony, to whom the Marud, This is Themis's son, the Titan, who for love to mortals shown, is doomed by Zeus, the penal suffering. 
go aid him if thou wilt these are to me an alien race and alien deities but thou sweet thea there can be than this no task or office more benefiting thee so when she at the word with hasty feet to some ravine hard by where sparkled free a tiny fount of water icy cold and took a hollow shell therein to hold the precious draught than amrita more sweet with fearless heart though hesitating gait low bending in her earnest sympathy she stood before the shape and raised on high the proffered cup with eyes compassionate and touched his lips with words of loving cheer and the great sufferer felt his pangs abate and looked on her with wondering as one to whom all kindness hath been long unknown and dropped amazed a solitary tear then o'er the wilderness a shadow passed with sounds of spirit wailing soft and low from rock and valley from the ground below from dark abysmal rifts and spaces vast from mossy stone and shrub and lonely tree came hollow murmurings o oh, thou who hast so much loved man and all created things thou who hast given us heaven aspiring wings prometheus soul of love we weep with thee silent in thought the four held on their way through sandy wastes past cinder's rapid stream till rose among the hills the distant gleam of manasa and here they made their stay it was a lake secluded in deep calm from worldly tumult and the troublous day where peace unbroken reigned so still and cool here might repose the heart with anguish full and every sorrow here might find its balm at length refreshed with welcome rest they rose crossing the hema mountains home of snow the stony girdle of the world and so entered on ariavartha's sacred close land of the marvellous here being tide swept on exultant through the long repose of silent centuries and glowing life came forth with thousand forms of beauty rife on flowery plain and shady mountain side so came they to a dwelling in the wild where weeping filled the house because to-day they said adaitia comes to bear away a victim from us shall it be our child that we must give the mother or the sire one must we offer else unreconciled he will not leave us o oh, unhappy fate so mourned the simple folk disconsolate lamenting loud in mingled grief and ire the father spoke out then me let him take lo i am old the earth no more to me brings fresh delight as once the flowery lee sunshine and music and sweet singing wake no answering echo in my spirit now the great gods smile on those who for the sake of others dare to die my life is done but you beloved ones leave on leave on through lengthened years and with unclouded brow to whom the mother quickly made reply and who will then protect our child where all is strange and perilous and help is small some strong defender should be ever by and therefore is it better that i go this heard the boy and raised with laughing eye a blade of spear grass in his hand and said with this will i strike off the giant's head the parents heard and smiled amid their woe then at the marut's word iridion took up his father's mighty sword a blade forged by celestial hands and lightly swayed the heavy falchion flashing in the sun and laughed to hear it whistle through the air so terrible as indra strode he on adown the forest path all hushed and dim a temple sculptured fair with leaf and limb and met and slew the cruel daitya there 
Such were the lessons which the Marut taught, lessons of pity and of hardihood. Then rose the four from that green solitude and floated westward over Hundremond, region of death, and past Canopus Hoar, fresh as a vision of the morning then, and sought the silence of the lonely western sea, unknown and vast with wild waves rolling free beyond Pyrene and the sunset shore. Through the dim shadows of the moonlit night, what phantom comes? The winds have sunk to sleep, there is no sound or motion on the deep, wrapped as a bride in veil of gauzy light. What gully, slow and ghost-like, parts the foam, with labouring oars and shredded sails of white, buttered with storms. Behold, said Sanadon, girt with his friends, Ulysses wanders on, adventurous, forgetful of his home. The large-browed chieftains from Scamander's plain, sages and warriors, kings of eldest time, sitting as gods, Ulysses with a rhyme of years upon his beard, the sails, the vein, were seen a moment through the gloom, then passed beyond their ken, and all was night again. Slow waned the hours, and when the morning came, and all the pearly orient grew aflame with crimson light, they reached their isle at last. But now strange notes of warning filled the air. The sun grew dark at noon without a cloud, and solemn voices nightly called aloud, The hour is well nigh come, prepare, prepare, Atlantis sinks in ruin, and the wave rolls over her who was ever while so fair. Men heard and trembled, Throughout all the land, life with its toils and pleasures seemed at stand. Death came apace, and none was there to save. Then came a voice by night to Sanadon. Arise and leave the island to its doom. Sadly replied he, let it be my tomb. If Indra's sons can die, I have put on this human nature with its warmth of love. Shall I renounce the blessings I have won? Shall I forsake these trusting hearts and rise false and a fugitive to yonder skies? I stay with them. Let the kind gods approve. The voice made answer, Thou hast spoken well. All things grow old and change, but love remains. Again the Marut, Ere our respite wanes, Ere comes the end and sounds the fatal knell, Tell me, O pitying spirit, may there be some rescue, some escape for those who dwell beneath my sceptre? Go thou forth alone, walk as a mortal through the dark unknown, replied the voice, so shall the rest be free. Thoughtful the Marut rose from fevered sleep and went abroad. The moon yet shone on high, the dews fell softly through the summer sky. He walked along the margin of the deep, and drank the healing quiet of the time. What saw he then that made his pulses leap with quick surprise? A stranded bark lay there, a wreck with naked ribs and timbers bare, drifted perchance from some far Scythian clime. Then came the light again into his eyes. Homeward he went, and straightway summoned all, by sound of trumpet, to the council hall and told them, thus assembled, in what guise deliverance might come, as yet the isle had launched no sea-boat. Let the great emprise be ventured now. Let strong and willing hands follow, as type, the wreck upon the sands, so might the gods upon their labour smile. They answered with a shout that shook the dome, as if with thunder. Then the work began, from sunny slopes and meads Elysian, from lonely bays, besprent with ocean foam, and dales where summer's choicest blossoms shone, trooping they came, forsaking house and home. So laboured they, untiring night and day, and ere two waning moons had passed away, a fleet was ready, and the work was done. Alas, ye lovely scenes, whose incense rose day after day in silent horizon, Ye veils and grooves of palms, all overgrown with trailing lilies, 
where the air was close with scent of odorous gums and passion flowers, your hour has come. Your ages of repose are now at end, and sudden ruin falls on all the glory of your festivals and all the festal splendor of your bowers. With quivering earthquake pangs, as if it feared to meet its tomb, the island slowly sang. The ships were crowded. Last upon the bank stood Sanadon, who waved his hand and cheered his parting friends and bade them all farewell. The sentence of the gods must be revered, and I remain a willing sacrifice that ye may live. And now, no more than this, think of me some time, wheresoe'er you dwell. Then rose a sound of many-voiced lament, Come with us, come, thou who art all our own, Still lead us on, we may not go alone, But he, as one that changeth not his bend, Remained unmoving, and with mournful eye Looked round on all that sad environment. His cherished ones were near, Swift to his side Evanay came with words of love and pride. Bravest and best, tis sweet with thee to die. The heavens darkened, yet the setting sun shed momentary splendor on the scene, where with bowed heads the Marut and the queen stood, with fair Thea and Eridion a pace or so behind. The maiden knelt in silent prayer, the hero leaned upon the mighty sword of proof, whose beamy ray now flashed a last farewell to light and day, ere in the depths below for aye it dwelt. So with the sound of thunder, and the war of elements and horror of deep night, the ocean waves, with floods of foamy white and sinews arms, wide curving from afar, whelmed in the deep the long indented shore. The darkness passed. The light of moon and star came forth again, and gentle breezes swept the plain of waters, but Atlantis slept far down in silence to awake no more. And they, the wanderers who ventured forth to seek a home beyond the unknown sea, how fared they on their way? They lived to be forefathers of the mighty ones of earth, founders of worldwide realms now vanished long but still to them the island of their birth was always sacred and in memory still lived unfading as the years rolled by a germ of legend and a theme for song age followed age great empires rose and fell but still evanay and sanadon lived in men's thoughts and ever urged them on to deeds heroic and there was a spell to youthful warriors in Eridian's name, and maidens wept to hear their mothers tell the story of sweet Thea, young and fair, who passed from out the golden summer air to icy death. Such was their meed of fame. End of Part 5 End of The Lost Island of Atlantis by E. T. Fletcher